I would like to introduce our main guest tonight, Crystal Worth, who is the founder and president of a nonprofit called Catering for the Homeless. And the mission of that organization is to utilize food excess from catering companies, schools, grocery stores, and restaurants for the homeless and the poor. Um, as well as uh, being the president, she's a published author, author excuse me, of several books on this specific subject. So tonight's main guest is Crystal Wolf. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to speak at your organization. I met Morton and his beautiful wife at the Kew Gardens Library where I was giving an Arthur talk and he kindly invited me to come tonight. Um, so I wanted to thank everybody and just speak a little bit more about who I am and what I'm doing throughout New York City. Um, so like, um, like he said, I am the founder and president of Catering for the Homeless Incorporated. I do have the 501c3 status and I'm working throughout the city to utilize food excess for the homeless and poor. I also am working with several politicians to have donation drop-offs of toiletry items for the homeless. So I provided about 15,000 toiletries for the homeless and shelters throughout Queens and in parks and on the subways. I also have a brown bag ministry where I put bags of food together and socks and scarves and I bring them to the homeless on the streets and the parks and I go down the seven train um, by myself going off on each stop to give the bags of food to the homeless, especially socks. Not everybody knows, but socks is the number one requested items for the homeless and shelters. Um, so I do tons of different toiletry drives, sock drives. I work with civic associations, politicians, churches. Um, so, and then with the food excess, my largest caterer on board is the Javits Center in Manhattan. Um, so that one caterer provides at least 10,000 meals a year. Um, so then I work with smaller catering companies and entertainment studios throughout Queens and Brooklyn and um, Manhattan. I'm really focused, I've been focused the last couple years on schools. Um, I don't know if everyone knows, but in September of 2017, Senator Joseph Adabo had a law that was passed for the schools to donate their excess food to nonprofits and to compost and recycle um, their food. So I've been working to get the schools on board, um, which I'm sure as you know, the DOE, it, it's a work in progress, but I'm not giving up because Literally, there's enough food going to waste that no one needs to be hungry. There's 133 billion pounds of food that goes to waste every year in America. And if the schools were willing to work with me and other nonprofits to utilize their food excess, it would probably end hunger in New York City and New York State. And then it would set a precedence that we could use for the nation. To, to end hunger. So and hunger is definitely a solvable problem, and so is homelessness. I, in my book, I, I've written several books, one book on homelessness, a poetry book, books, fiction. I write all different genres. But this is my book on homelessness, or Invisible Neighbors, with accounts, causes, and solutions to homelessness. So an, a love, another large part of what I do is advocacy and education. I speak at libraries, schools, community meetings. Um, I'm on community board five. I'm on Brian Barnwell's advisory board because this is a political problem and it's also an individual problem. This is, I believe, our humanity is at stake. Um, in the book, I talk about ways that we as individuals can help the homeless and ways we as a community can help the homeless and also political solutions. I interviewed politicians such as Alan Hevesy's son, Andrew Hevesy. I'm a big fan of Andrew Hevesy. Um, <laughs> yeah, go Andrew Hevesy, yes. <laughs> I interviewed him twice for the first edition and the second edition. Um, he has a wonderful solution for homelessness. It's the first 
comprehensive preventative homelessness plan, home stability support. Yes, thank you, Andrew Hevesy. Yes. And it saves the government 30% of what it's already spending on homelessness, and then, and then that money could be used to end existing homelessness. And home stability support is a five-year program. It's a rent subsidy, and you have to be working to be eligible for the program. And it, it, um, it will, it, it's up to five years, because poverty usually takes more than two years to get out of. The Advantage program was a two-year program that ended in 2014. And that's when New York City saw a huge rise in homelessness. According to Coalition for the Homeless, homelessness has raised 10,000 to 15,000 homeless every year since 2014, since that program was cut. So we desperately need more social services. That's one of the solutions. I also interviewed um, Brian Barnwell, Assemblyman Brian Barnwell. And um, he has a lot of different bills that pertain to affordable housing, domestic violence, um, which is a plays a huge role in homelessness. I'm on his advisory board, and I'm working with certain politicians to turn my solutions into bills. Um, I'm going to be working with Assemblywoman Catalina Cruz in July. Um, because homelessness is a lot more complex of an issue than people realize. There's a lot of arms and legs to it. There's a lot of causes to it and misperceptions. And that's why I speak in the community on a weekly basis, because I'm trying to get the truth out there. I'm trying to alleviate people's concerns about homelessness. Um, a lot of people's views on the homeless aren't accurate. Statistically, this, these are statistics are from coalition from the homeless. But 70% of the homeless in New York City are families. 40% are children. 10% of children in New York City schools are homeless. But the homeless that we typically see on the streets are the ones that are mentally ill, the ones that may have addiction problems. I, I see a lot of elderly homeless on the streets because they don't want to go into the shelters. People might not want to go into the shelters because of safety. There's, there are crimes that go on in the shelters, and people get attacked in the shelters. Um, it's also a very intensive process to get into the shelters. You have to have a lot of screening. You have to have a lot, a lot of paperwork. You have to have a lot of testing. So, and, and you don't, it's not guaranteed shelter. Um, it is if it's below 32 degrees, and New York City is one of the one of two cities in America that has the right to shelter in those conditions, Washington D.C. is the other city that that um, has that humanity. But a lot of people fear property values going down if a homeless shelter is brought into their community. Statistically, property values go up when the homeless are safely out of sight and safely in housing. So whether you're coming into a community and you see the homeless and you're afraid of them or you're, you feel bad for them, if, if the homeless aren't on the streets, it makes you feel better about being a part of our community. Also, as a homeless person, you're more likely to be the victim of a crime than you are to commit a crime. And statistically, the crimes that homeless commit are usually ones of petty theft and not violence. So most of the homeless in the shelters are the families. And domestic violence is a leading cause of homelessness. We desperately need more laws and more judges, honest judges, to enforce these laws. Andrew Hevesy was telling me in one of our interviews how he was cracking down on one of his bills to help with, these, um, with the protective orders usually against women, but also men, because women are being killed every day on protection orders that are violated. Brian Barnwell also has a bill for protective orders that if, they're, if someone um, violates the order with violence, they're mandatory to go to jail for six months. Because unfortunately, um, the judges continuously let these men off until Sometimes the women, it comes to the point where the women and or the children are killed. 
there were literally double the amount of women killed during the war in Afghanistan than soldiers that were killed in the war. There is a war on women, and it's very important for me to advocate for this domestic violence because millions of people are being affected, millions of children are being affected, and it's something that is a scar that you carry with you for the rest of your life. Another thing, in another part of my book, the first part of my book is interviews with the homeless, and a common denominator that I found was abuse. In chapter two, I interview a doctor who has been the homeless, who has been the doctor to the homeless for 35 years. And her common denominator was someone that was abused as a baby. Abuse plays into the pattern of continued domestic violence as an adult. It goes into poverty. It goes into homelessness. It all plays together. Um, so unfortunately, 95% of government services are offered to the perpetrator who often doesn't think they have a problem or the addict, the perpetrator, the criminal. The services are offered to them while the victim suffers the rest of their life in poverty, in, in anxiety, in depression, all, there's links to suicide. So the suffering is, is astronomical and I believe that we really need to have more laws to protect the victim and more social services for the victim. Another example is AA. I was looking up to see how many AAs there were in Middle Village. There were more AAs in Middle Village than there were Al-Anons in all of Queens. Al-Anons, most people haven't even heard of Al-Anon. Al-Anon is the support group for people that are victims of alcoholics or drug dealers. And people really, there's very little research to even show how much damage is being done to the victims. And Hevesy also is working on domestic, oh, sure. Well, I'll just, let me just finish with talking a little bit more about um, my accomplishments, so I have provided about 30,000 meals so far for the homeless and poor. Thank you. Um, and Goodwill, I'm partnering with Goodwill and, and others in the community um, to get their surplus of clothes to the homeless and shelters, so we've provided over 200 bags of clothes. Um, and then I will open up to questions, and if anybody wants to support me by purchasing a book, uh, a, a portion of the proceeds goes toward my work to serve and help the homeless, and I, I'd be happy to sign it for you. And then I'll just open up now if anyone has any questions. Um, Our Invisible Neighbors is $20. I also have a fiction, um, it's an epic fantasy that's $20, and a poetry book that is $15, and I do take credit card. Yeah. Oh, sure. Anyone else? Do you have any questions? Any questions? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Well, this isn't for you, Crystal, but this is about the elephant in the room. Where <coughs> oh. Do you have any plans now and in the future to run in any office of legislature? No. Be shy. Be shy. Uh, mm -hmm. oh. Are you familiar with Rutgers and Rutgers? With what? Rutgers-Bregman. I can't hear you. Sure. Um, Rutgers-Bregman in his book um, talks that one of the, the simplest ways to solve homelessness is to build homes for them. Um, is that an idea that's ever floated? To, that, that, it's basically it's a, it's a straight line. And the simplest way to solve homelessness is to get them home. There's actually enough homes that are vacated in America that every homeless person could have six. And Comptroller Scott Stringer did an audit of how many vacated buildings there are in New York City. And there's, there's 1,150 buildings that could be converted into permanent housing that would provide 65,000 homeless, 65,000 homes. So we could build but we also could utilize what we already have. Uh, and is anyone working towards that? I mean, to, to give them permanent housing? 
Uh, well, we're all working toward that. I, there's a lot, I mean, a lot of people are working toward that. Um, I, I didn't get to, I, there's so much in the book that I, I uh, like Housing First, for instance, is a proven method to end homelessness. It's, it's been utilized throughout America. It, it you virtually ended homelessness in Finland and Canada. I, I was gonna read an excerpt, but I don't think we have time. But the premise of Housing First is to give homeless homes and then give them the supportive housing and supportive services they need to get back on their feet. So this was utilized in Utah. That was the first state to end chronic homelessness. It was developed in New York City, but it was never utilized in New York City. It ended homelessness, it ended veteran homelessness in 53 communities during the Obama administration. So there's different types of homelessness, and this has been used to end certain types of homelessness in this country and in Canada and in Finland. Because homelessness is a global issue. All of Europe is struggling with homelessness. South America is struggling with homelessness. Finland is the only country that has really made strides to ending homelessness, and it was by using housing first. Stan. Yes. Hey. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, shelters. Mm -hmm. take, take a young married couple with children. <coughs> ACS will put them into a shelter with a kitchen mm -hmm. because they have children. Then, if the children are taken away or fostered, they would, would take them out of the shelter because they are no longer a family, even though they are married, put them in another shelter where there is no kitchen and they have to scrounge at the stores. Do you approach this issue and we can talk about it later? Well, I don't control, I mean, I, I work with DHS to get toiletries to the homeless and I've been asking for years to be able to give food to the shelters. But as far as wh what you're saying, I understand and I agree that we do need permanent solutions and there are permanent solutions available but I think it's better for the homeless to have shelter, even if it's without a kitchen, than to be on the streets. Right, even if they put them into supportive housing. Some of these right. people don't know the difference between supportive housing mm -hmm. and supported housing. All right, two I, I last, two last questions. Stan, go ahead. Okay. One second. Oh, no. uh, one Stan, second. go ahead. Stan. Okay. One second. Okay. Okay. Stan, go ahead. Yeah. You yeah. explain it. Yeah. No, you said you need it's not annually because it's. <laughs> no, my question yeah. is: if you know how many meals you deliver, how do you, what means do you use to get these meals to the people? Okay, uh, so the practical. So let's start with the Javits Center. That's my largest caterer on board. They package the food there. I coordinate who picks up the food. So when I got Javits Center on board, I contacted 15 churches in the area and several nonprofits in the area. So then they give me 24 hours usually notice and I contact all the people in the area of Midtown Manhattan to see who's able, available to make the pickup. So then I arrange that food pickup. So because, and right now it's limited to what I can coordinate, but eventually I am hoping to get the funding to turn this into a login program on my website so that people can log in to claim and pick up the food so that it's unlimited. It's unlimited to feed people throughout New York City and throughout the nation. So the Javits Center, one pickup from the Javits Center feeds 200 to 1600 people. So then entertainment studios I work with, I might make that pickup myself. I get catering tins at the dollar store. I go to the entertainment studio. I put the food together. I bring it to a church. It feeds 30 to 50 meals. So it's all different levels of meals. Sometimes I package it, sometimes they package it. If it's in Manhattan, I'm not gonna make the food pickup because then I have to pay tolls, et cetera, et cetera. But any time there's a catering company, a restaurant, a school that has that food excess, my, my organization connects them to the church or nonprofit that can pick up and utilize that food in all different ways. I have over 70 partners. 
So I have 10 churches on board, and they all have their food ministry to the homeless or the poor in a different way. Some have soup kitchens, some have food pantries. Coalition for the Homeless feeds the homeless every day, but only in a certain area of Manhattan. They only will make a pickup Monday through Wednesday. So I know when the Javits Center calls, if the pickup's for Monday or Wednesday, I'm gonna call Coalition for the Homeless. If it's Thursday through Sunday, I'm gonna call one of the churches. So that's one example. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.